This is Don Ferguson for the Keys Dive Guide channel. In 1996, I produced Galleon Hunter, a 90-minute VHS video that was the first publication of any kind to cover 18 shipwrecks associated with the ill-fated 1733 Armada, including the GPS coordinates for all of the wreck sites. Since most of the footage you're about to see was shot in 1994, 1995, and 1996, I may look a little older now, but the accuracy of my GPS coordinates and shore bearings remains the same. Today we're visiting Los Angustias in El Sueco de Arizona. The 16th and 17th shipwrecks of the 1733 fleet we've discussed in the Galleon Hunter Dive Odyssey. I hope you enjoy the show. As always, I've had a great time diving with my friend Karen. After taking Karen back to Fiesta Key, I head down to the city of Layton on Long Key, Florida. I'm meeting my friends Stefan Sakura and Dan Baker for a two-wreck adventure. We're going to the last two wreck sites in Galleon Alley. The first target, number 16 on the old chart, Nuestra Señora de las Angustias y San Rafael was nicknamed El Charanguero Grande, or the Large Coastal Trader. She was an English-built vessel of 328 tons, carrying bullion, specie, worked silver, and Chinese porcelain along with dyes, spices, and other organic cargo from the New World. She was owned by Don Joseph Sanchez de Madrid and piloted by Don Francisco Sanchez de Madrid. Las Angustias is located about 800 yards seaward from the Long Key Viaduct near the middle of Long Key Channel. Consistently miserable visibility of less than 10 feet, strong tidal currents, and large channel sharks make this wreck site a difficult, potentially dangerous dive. Even though situated in only 9 feet of water, you usually can't see her ballast from topside. We're going to find Las Angustias the hard way by using the Long Key Bridge Ranges to position us right on top of her. First, we align the 16th power line pole from the west end of Long Key on the old bridge arch with two blue squares painted on it. The blue squares are chipped and faded, but still visible. It's about 345 degrees north-northwest to the 16th pole from the wreck site. Uh, arch. Arch. That's the 16th piling there. Count it. You mean the 16th yeah. telephone? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah telephone. Uh, from, from way down there. Oh, the first one in the water. Two, oh, the first one in, in the a, water. No, in a, in a land there. On the land. land. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It's also about 045 degrees northeast to the west end of Long Key and about 275 degrees almost due west to the eastern end of the conch keys. Then, we position the old sweat bank marker in the Gulf of Mexico on the inside edge of the second arch to the left of the 17th power line pole from the west end of Long Key. Well, give me about 10 more feet. Wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, the marker must come out. Give me a ten feet. I need to go to west. Ten feet of line? Ten feet of line. Five feet. Start giving me the line and I'm going to see it. The marker must come out. Ten oh. more feet. Give me, okay, give me five more feet. Oh, you didn't give me yet nothing. You just 
drop it. No, in the I water. did. I gave you. I gave you ten. Right, okay. Right. Give you five more. If I'm gonna yell, pull the anchor back again. Okay. We slowly drifting there. We slowly drifting there. We slowly drifting there and hold it. Right. See, it must be that side the buoy. To the this side. That, no, that side. The that buoy. side. That side. And that little mark, which is the second arc due west. Right. And the horizon. Right. That's the mark. That must be a firing seven. Therefore, we are not near the mark over there. All right, let's get it. Okay. Here's the long key bridge range that I drew the first time I dive Los Angustias. Notice the position of the 16th and 17th power line poles with the old sweat bank marker barely visible on the inside edge of the second arch to the west of the 17th pole. This range will put you right on top of the wreck with the same precision as these GPS coordinates. This underwater map of Los Angustias, prepared by the Florida Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Research in 2005, shows a massive wreck site with ballast spread out in an area over 150 feet long by 80 feet wide. This satellite view of the area shows the wreck's position relative to the main topographical features of the area. From the mid-1970s into the early 1990s, significant pottery shards as well as conglomerate encasing metal nails and other rigging components were recovered from this watery grave. Debris from the wreck continues in a northwesterly track on in toward the Long Key Viaduct and through the bridge into the Gulf of Mexico. Due to the two-knot current of the ingoing and outgoing tides, it is best to visit Las Angustias at slack high tide, which lasts for about an hour. The high tide brings in ocean water, which is somewhat clearer than the murky Gulf of Mexico water that envelops the wreck during low tide. As an extra precaution, when diving any channel dives, I always double the length of the tag line to 200 feet. Even in water with the visibility of split pea soup, Los Angustias is an oasis of marine creatures in the barren Long Key Channel. The southern ray is a favorite meal of the huge hammerhead sharks that ply these waters. Monster-sized sharks live in every channel in the Keys and Long Key Channel is no exception. Luckily for divers, humans are not a preferred item on a shark's dinner menu. The man-eating predator myth created by Hollywood and cable TV channels to sell theater tickets and commercials really doesn't exist. Let's look at the facts. I'm a veteran of thousands and thousands of ocean dives. I've ocean dived every season of the year and every hour of the day and night. I've dived in good visibility and bad visibility. Cold water, warm water, calm seas, and rough seas, deep water and shallow water. I've gathered lobster and speared fish. I've dived alone hundreds of times. I've allowed myself to be trolled behind a boat, clinging onto a ski line handle for hundreds of miles, scouring the ocean bottom looking for shipwrecks. Now I'm not advising anyone to do what I have done. Thousands of shark attacks on humans have been documented. However, most of these attacks are a case of mistaken identity. The shark mistakes a human for its normal prey. Often there's spearfishing or murky water involved. 
Sharks are not only predators, but scavengers as well. They take the very young, the very old, the injured and the sickly, thus providing a vital service in an underwater world where survival of the fittest is the rule. The ship's name, Los Angustias, means the anguish in Spanish. Diving on this wreck site with less than five feet of visibility is an eerie sensation. It's like you're swimming with the ghosts of all the people who lost their lives when the 1733 fleet exploded into the shallows. Slack tide lasts a little less than one hour. I can feel the current of the outgoing tide getting stronger. It's time to head back to the boat. Las Angustias was rediscovered by Jack Haskins and Dick McAllister in 1972. A treasure salvage legend, Jack Haskins visited the Archive of the Indies in Seville, Spain numerous times to gather information about the 1733 Spanish Armada. During these visits, Jack taught himself archaic Spanish and translated a trove of letters from the Spanish salvers to the King of Spain regarding the wreck sites and treasure recoveries from the doomed ships. From these documents, Jack learned the huge waves generated by the violent hurricane had broken the keel of Las Angustias, a ghost ship of the fleet that had not been relocated by modern salvers. A vessel with a broken keel could not be refloated by the Spanish. From an old chart of the 1733 wreck sites obtained at the Archive of the Indies, Jack made an educated guess that the bottom of Las Angustias rested somewhere in the murky water of Long Key Channel. Amazingly, Jack found Las Angustias on the very first day of the search. Las Angustias is a spooky dive. Every time I've dived her, it feels like I'm being watched by an evil spirit whose tomb I have invaded. We're heading down to the last wreck site in Galleon Alley, about two miles, 240 degrees, to the southwest of Las Angustias. Number 17 on the old chart, her proper name was Nuestra Senora del Rosario, San Antonio y San Vicente Ferrer, or Our Lady of the Rosary, St. Anthony and St. Vincent Ferrer. Her nickname was El Sueco de Arazón, or the Swede of Arazón. She was owned by Don Jaquito de Arazón and piloted by Don Juan de Arazón. El Sueco was a vessel of approximately 200 tons. She remained intact until she reached the shallows. She then smashed aground in eight feet of water, bow to sea, stern to shore with a portion of the ship continuing in closer to shore, disintegrating in the process. The final position of El Sueco with her bow facing seaward and her stern facing shoreward is not uncommon on the 1733 Armada wreck sites. Before plowing deep into their final resting places, many of these ships struck bottom several times, only to be lifted forward by the next 20-foot swell. These bottom strikes cause significant damage, usually destroying the steerage mechanisms, including the rudder. Without a rudder to guide them, the towering stern castles of these ungainly vessels acted like a sail, catching the 100 mile an hour plus winds, sending the helpless ships into a slow death spiral, often causing their bows to face seaward or even parallel to the shoreline until they could move no further. El Sueco was moving stern forward or backwards when she found the ocean bottom for the last time. Our first target is El Sueco's main ballast mound. We're going to relocate this historic wreck site using an old school technique called mowing the grass. 
Dan Baker, a freelance network videographer based in Marathon, volunteers for reconnaissance duty. Stefan tows Dan on a water ski line as he snorkels in the general vicinity of the wreck. Dan positions himself just behind the prop wash of the boat engine, looking down for El Suaco's egg rock ballast stones. We mow the grass back and forth for nearly 10 minutes. Finally, Dan spots her. El Sueco de Arizon is about 1,300 yards south of Conk Key and 900 yards, 140 degrees, almost due southeast of Walker's Island. She's also about one mile to the east of Hawks Cay Resort on Duck Key. Here are a few of my shore ranges, drawn when anchored right over the wreck site. This underwater map of El Sueco, prepared by the Florida Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Research in 2005, reflects one of the smaller ballast mounds of the 1733 fleet wreck sites. Since El Sueco only displaced about 200 tons, we see a rather diminutive 60 foot by 20 foot main ballast pile with a small 10 foot by 10 foot scatter nearby. This satellite image shows the main topographical features of the area. After tossing Dan his gear, I waste no time in joining him below. We've got good viz on this normally murky site today. As with all of these doomed shipwrecks, schools of Silverside, Grunt, Angelfish, Snapper, Bermuda Chub, Porkfish, Tang, Barjack, and numerous grouper cloud the site. It's a safe bet that wherever smaller fish congregate, a resident barracuda will also patrol the area, which provides a smorgasbord of tasty treats for these magnificent predators. In volume 11 of Key's Dive Guide, we visit The Rock, one of Marathon's many outstanding dive sites, and meet Rocky, a spunky four-foot barracuda. Rocky has the personality of a friendly dog. Sometimes he'll get within inches of my mask, his teeth snapping playfully as he brown noses for a handout. Rocky loves his bait fish treats, but he doesn't have very good table manners. Check out Rocky's rear dorsal fin wagging back and forth like an excited puppy dog's tail. Not all barracuda are friendly like Rocky. Remember to treat all sea creatures with respect, no matter how large or how small. According to her manifest, El Sueco was carrying 24,000 pesos of cob coins, silver specie, and silver bullion when she departed Havana, Cuba for Cadiz, Spain. Along with her cargo of silver, 
El Sueco carried king size porcelain from Manila, animal hides as well as work leather, indigo, cochineal, vanilla, tobacco, chocolate, cocoa leaves, and vanilla. This clump of fire bricks from the Florida Bureau of Underwater Archaeology in Tallahassee was part of the oven on El Sueca. Here is another clump of fire bricks that remain nearby the wreck. Individual fire bricks pepper the ballast mound as well. The ovens on these ships were primarily used for cooking in calm seas. Each ship carried livestock to butcher as needed. The ovens could also forge iron to fabricate or repair metal rigging components. All ships carried a matate, a grinding stone used to grind corn for the preparation of tortillas and wheat for the preparation of flour. The main ballast mound of El Sueco was rediscovered by renowned treasure salver Marty Maylock and his associate Don Thomas in 1964. One year later, Marty turned the wreck over to Mel Fisher and his Armada Research Group, who held a Florida state lease to search in the general vicinity of Long Key to Duck Key. Subsequently, Mel gave the okay to a group of salvers including the legendary Bob Weller, Brad Patton, Ray Manieri, and Pat Patterson to salvage the site. The Royal Fifth Group, as these salvers called themselves, hit pay dirt with a large recovery of Mexico minted four and eight reals cob coins dated 1727 to 1730, as well as a trove of pillar dollars dated 1732 the first coins minted in a screw press in the new world. Join us in volume 24 of Keys Dive Guide for a comprehensive look at the Spanish colonial silver and gold coins the treasure galleons carried in their holds. Very little silver was recovered from El Sueco's main ballast mound after the initial recovery by the Royal Fifth Group. That's probably because most of the registered treasure would have been stowed in the stern castle, or the rear of the ship, which detached from the main body of El Sueco. The modular design used to construct galleons and merchant nows of the 16 and 1700s often caused these wooden vessels to break up into numerous parts during as well as after sinking. In 1995, during a visit with Mel Fisher at his museum in Key West, I asked Mel what he thought about El Sueco and her main ballast mound. I'll tell you what, that's not where the treasure is, if you want treasure. <laughs> that's where there's a, a ballast pile, you know. Uh -huh. The treasure is scattered all over hell, you know. And uh, it, it stopped there, but then the stern broke off and it tumbled and rolled. And every time a big 20-foot wave would hit it, it'd pick it up and smash it and pick it up and smash it. So if you're looking for treasure, you're going you're gonna to have to do a lot of work. <laughs> As El Sueco's stern castle plowed shoreward to the northwest, disintegrating slowly, piece by piece, stone by stone, a trail of treasure was spread out for miles into the shallows. Through the years, silver recoveries have been made on this trail into Walker's Island, Tom's Harbor Cut, over to the Gulf side of the Overseas Highway, including the Conch Key Banks, Channel Key, and on in to Tom's Harbor Channel. These unrestored four and eight reals cob coins were recovered from El Sueco. They've both undergone electrolysis to stabilize the silver within the encrustation and were coated with Incralac and Cabosil to protect them indefinitely. 
We're idling a few hundred yards to the northwest from El Sueco's main ballast mound to another scatter of her ballast. This small 30 by 30 foot area of egg-shaped river rock is punctuated by numerous sea whips and sea rods. It's time to drop Dan and Stefan off in late and then head back to Fiesta Key to retrieve my boat. Back on the overseas highway, I head into the setting sun. The dive odyssey continues tomorrow. I want to thank my technical advisor, Stefan Sakura. Stefan is a brilliant navigator, a renowned treasure salver, and as a shipwreck historian, he's a true genius. Stefan transforms himself into the minds of ancient mariners to unlock secrets of the past. Yeah, let's go.